My name is Jake, and I am the director of Close for Storm. Close for Storm is my directorial debut. It is my feature-length documentary, an extension of my YouTube videos, uh, something I've been making for many, many years now. And it's on perhaps one of the most interesting topics, to me at least, an abandoned theme park in America. <laughs> Write Some Films is my YouTube channel that I started. Actually, I started it under a different name, Bright Sun Gaming, in 2012. I changed the name to Bright Sun Films to better reflect on the the, the content I was making at the time, uh, which was pretty much completely based on uh, short documentaries and no longer the awful gaming videos that I was making. That's where the whole rebranding of my channel and really when I took a, a, a serious look into making video production into a legitimate career for my entire future. Jake and I started working together a couple of years ago on some of his YouTube content and at the end of 2019 he reached out and asked me if I was interested in being a part of a more long-form project. I think from at least 2017, I've been sort of dreaming of doing something much bigger. And a feature documentary was sort of always uh, at the end of the tunnel, something that I've always wanted to, to go for. I think it wasn't until about 2019 when I had the idea for Close for Storm and, and doing something on, uh, on Six Flags. Six Flags is like, it's the apotheosis of, of abandoned places in, in, uh, in the world, essentially. It's like the coolest abandoned entertainment spot by far, I, I'd say. I grew up in Louisiana. I live an hour away from New Orleans in Baton Rouge, and I went to Six Flags New Orleans when I was a kid. At first, I wanted to just tell the story of Six Flags New Orleans, how it got like this. I had a feeling we were going to start digging into deeper stuff and the idea for a, a real feature documentary sort of dawned on me. I started thinking about what we could do with the blessing of time, the, the almighty time inside something, right? So you see a lot of these YouTube videos going into Six Flags New Orleans, but they're very rushed and I was thinking to myself, what could I do if we got access to the theme park and were able to have the blessing of time in order to tell a, a much grander story in perhaps a more cinematic way. When you decide that you're going to make something big and significant, you, there's a lot more steps to just, oh, we're just gonna edit this video like you would do for YouTube. It's very hard to compare a feature documentary to a YouTube video. And I didn't think it would be that different at first, but boy, was I wrong. My good friend, Matt Leeds, who was the composer on this, um, was telling me about Jake's project. This was the real deal. This was a movie. This was something a little bit larger, and Jake was in need of some help. He knew someone named Nicholas Novak, uh, a post producer who worked at uh, Mythical, Mythical Entertainment, and he put me in touch with him, and we had a post producer now. <laughs> the project just became bigger and bigger and bigger, and then until we were at the point where we're shooting with red cameras uh, uh, for our interviews. And, you know, we have like 15 people in post-production working on this. It got crazy. We had so many people on board with this. And it's like, this started as a YouTube video. And now we're at a 75 minute feature documentary that's going to be on video on demand platforms. It's insane. Throughout the years, uh... Being a filmmaker, I've always floated around the idea of doing a project like this. And when I found out that Jake was actually working on a project like this, I had to be involved. And so I reached out to him, told him that I would do what I need to do, be his feet on the ground since he's from Canada and I actually live in Louisiana. Finding people to interview was honestly pretty tough. Uh, a lot of people are still in the industry, don't want to talk about this. One thing that surprised me going into it was that it's still a sensitive subject for some people, and we encountered that, some pushback from some people who worked there. They had sent us an email saying something along the lines of, we looked you up on YouTube, we don't think the park was abandoned, and we're going to message everyone on our Facebook group uh, as a collective of all of these people who worked at the park 
and tell them not to participate in your film. This was a special place for people, and it's kind of now this lasting monument to Katrina. I think it's important that people watch and realize how insane it is that this park is still sitting there to this day. Six Flags New Orleans is a monument of Katrina, a monument of the trauma from Katrina. You know, it's, it's a physical representation of it. At first glance, you know, you may see uh, just an abandoned theme park, but really there are uh, so many other different aspects of the story that we, we really get into um, and why this park is important. The people who live in New Orleans East, every single one of them knows about the park. It's in their backyard. They hate it. They hate seeing it. They want to see something done with it. Anything is better than, you know, a rusting out old abandoned amusement park. What was this area called? This is Main Street. Main Streets. Very cool. We're the crew. Up today, yeah, wrapping up day one. So we traveled, uh, I think, in total three different times. One in June of 2019 to film the park. Uh, and then in September of 2019, we returned to do our interviews. And then one last time in, uh, I think, I believe it was January 2020 to do some uh, last minute B-roll. You know, as a person who loves abandoned places, I've always dreamt about going to Six Flags New Orleans in some way. I I've always wanted to see it, uh, at least once before it was gone. So being able to stay there and, and walk around and drive your car through the park was incredible it, it was elating to me it, it was unbelievable you'll see like it's amazing are those more security yeah more security. all right Brian. just give them a wave and you just drive right in we're coming into the park oh my god we're driving <laughs> so jake what do we got there buddy we're looking at a map and deciding where we shall film and this is behind the scenes for Closed for the storm. Oh my god, this is the weirdest day of my life. I know. Look at all the, the steel work too. I know. Like this is not a this is not a sight that many people get to see no. right here. Beauty oh. shot. Yo, see if you can get a yeah, lake reflection. Look at the reflection. When the sun would set every night. It's like a completely different atmosphere in the park. The nightlife just becomes extremely present in the park. And I remember we were doing one shot with Emmy walking down the, the main streets of the park with her flashlights. And uh, Brian, our drone operator, was following her with, uh, with his drone. And the shots he was getting, it, it's just the coolest stuff. So on our last day, as we were trying to finish up our pickup shots throughout the park for B-roll, we uh, we decided we're gonna climb one of the, the coasters, um, the uh, the part where it comes out of its corkscrew and it's uh, and it's pretty high above. And I have a terrifying uh, fear of heights. So as we're climbing the spiral staircase up to one of the the service uh, walkways on top of this coaster, and the sun is setting, I'm terrified of heights, but I'm also like on this rickety steel frame on top of this abandoned roller coaster, overlooking this abandoned theme park in the middle of a swamp. And it is probably one of the most like memorably iconic moments of my life. It's like one of the most incredible sights I have ever seen. Just uh, the perfect way to wrap up filming. And we got exactly what we need, which means that's a wrap. If I had to describe the post process in one word, it would be walls. And I say walls because a lot of this happened during a pandemic in which I was just living in my room working on this. And then also all of the different barriers that you kind of run into with the nature of a documentary. Describe the post-production in one word. Um, arduous, I would say. Building out the team was the easy part because before I kind of put myself in a situation to do this, I kind of already had a good idea of a couple key players that I wanted to be involved with this. Chris, who did sound for this, is someone that I've been working with since 2014. And then Liz as well, who did color for this, I've also been working with her since 2014. 
and in college we were kind of like a trio that always created stuff together. This had uh, turned into something way more uh, all-encompassing than, than I think anyone ever thought. I think with a documentary, you have to look at post-production as this is the time where we're telling the story. Because when you go shoot a documentary, you don't know exactly what you're going to get until you've done it. Having the inputs and having the uh, the professional advice that Nick and Chris and Matt, Liz, they all bring to the project, I, I mean, the, it, it's, it brings it to a completely different level. Our editors, they all really knew how to structure a movie and how to move uh, interviews along. Jake did a really good job with getting all these different people that had these different levels of involvement with the part. We had people that work there, you know, from like really small capacities of just like, you know, doing the day to day. We have people that are more involved with like the government. We have like all these sort of different people that care about the park for different reasons. And so for that, it was really just focusing on how can we tell all these different people's angles and convey that into a documentary. And me just sitting there, you know, talking to them and, and watching the process, it really helped me grow as a person and, and learn as a filmmaker. Hearing the score for the first time was unbelievably exciting. I believe I was in a car driving home from Florida, I think, during that time. I think we were driving back to, to Canada, and we all listened to it in the car, and I think all of our mouths dropped. Words can't articulate how I feel about the score in this film. So the tone I wanted to capture in providing a voice for the film was to really capture a sense of the American spirit. He is so into this kind of Americana new style and like loving to bring back like the nostalgia of the glory days. I wanted to feel like when you were seeing shots of the park and experiencing shots of the park, you felt like you yourself could have been someone who would have experienced it regardless of uh, whether what you had or not. I could say with absolute certainty that Closer Storm Honestly, it would not be half the film it is without Matt's score. It, uh, it really brings everything to the next level, and he did an incredible job. By comparison to some of the other projects that I've been able to work on, uh, I've been so lucky to be a part of, the sound of this film is very unique and that it was able to take on a role and a style to which I had not been able to ever contribute before to a film or to any any product. The, the Americana aspect of things is something that you know I had always personally admired, but never been able to uh, write or contribute. You know, most film and television nowadays has a very uh, specific sound, and I think that this will really stand out in that space. Definitely one of the most important highlights for me was to be able to contribute to the experience of Patricia walking through the park. While Jake and I were spotting a rough cut of the film with Matt, Victoria, and Michael for score, Derek said, I figured it out. And that was all he said. Specifically the moment in which she comes to the lake and you know you can see the Ferris wheel in the background and then we, we cut back to some archival footage from that exact same location. Derek was able to essentially put together a montage of different VHS footage that really ended up translating very well to the nostalgia and the desire to bring family entertainment back to New Orleans is in need. Home videos are very personal just because whenever somebody's captured with it, it's a moment of importance. We wanted to kind of highlight these really happy moments because the park for so many people exists in memory. So we want to really just create that sort of artificial nostalgia for people that have never been to New Orleans, don't know the park, to understand why it was important. It encapsulates the fact that, you know, the park existed to create happiness for other people. I think the first feeling I had when watching the final film was, wow, we did it. It's such an enormous journey from sitting in the blistering hot New Orleans sun, uh, you know, having my car with the ignition on for eight hours at a time because we need air conditioning, to sitting in Nick's bedroom, uh, watching the final cut of Closer Storm. It's, it's an incredible journey you take through a production of something like this. I did actually get to watch the film 
screened at the uh, New Orleans Film Festival. And uh, that was an awesome experience, just getting to actually sit there and watch it on the big screen. One of our key drivers and our, our key goals from the very beginning was, no matter what, let's go for the New Orleans Film Festival. I think it was just really appropriate to have it there. And I hope, uh, I hope people, especially who live in New Orleans, really enjoyed what we did, what we made. So Closer Storm is my directorial debut. It is my first feature documentary, and I'm always going to love it for that. I think we made a really great movie. I had a fantastic experience making it, and I hope everyone else enjoys watching it as much as I did, like the 300 times I've watched it so far. Go check it out right now. It's here. Go watch Close for Storm now. I hope everyone enjoys the movie, and Closer Storm is out on all video-on-demand platforms right now. Thank you all so much for watching.